start a little bit with our extinction segment and uh, related questions. Okay, so here's the first one. A uh, fellow asked the following, and I'm going to try to answer him. He says, uh, I wish Melee, he spelled that, misspelled that. I wish me lay the best of the best, but it will be very hard. People there are in Argentina, right? He's the president of Argentina. Uh, don't know how to live without government help. Then he continues, and he says, uh, what do you think will happen in the U.S. this year with presidential elections? Okay, first let me clarify something about uh, Millet's last name. Someone asked about that. Millet in Spanish, Millet, if you separate those two words, uh, stands for my law. That's direct, except that uh, Millet, his last name is with I, whereas my law, Mile, stands, uh, goes with a Y, okay? That's the only difference. But the pronunciation is the same. So Mile stands for my law, and I guess, yeah, he did it his way. <laughs> okay, just so you know. Anyways, I don't care about politics. Uh, not into politics for many, many years now. Got out of politics. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you learn a lot over time, and uh, politics is essentially opinion. It's opinion, and therefore, uh, opinion, what is opinion? Opinion is religion, you know, uh, just belief. So one person has one belief or, or another, or uh, you have uh, recommendations for how the world should be run, et cetera, et cetera, and they go with this guy because they think that person's going to deliver what he thinks is the ideal situation or the, the ideal politics or whatever. And, you know, I'm, I'm way out of that completely today. I don't get involved into choosing sides or any of that. What I do is essentially say, you know, um, I, I work at it the other way around. First of all, I only look at politics in relation to, and economics in relation to extinction. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. But then the other one is that um, I don't say this is what we should do, this is what is good or et cetera or bad or whatever. Now I say, look, if you do this, this will be the consequence. And that's more like what is taught in political science. You know, political science includes a lot of subjects, including murder, I guess, you know, of, uh, assassinations. Uh, it's not really part of political science, but, you know, it's not, not a branch of political science, but it is part of politics, right? So even that's acceptable or in, in the political world. And you have to get used to it. Yeah, there are assassinations, and that might even happen to this gentleman, Millet. He may not make it to the end of his term. Okay, <laughs> okay. And I'll withhold my opinion on that. Anyways, the point here is that you know, I don't look at it. Uh, this is what we should do, and this is what the uh, uh, politicians should do. No, if they do this, this is going to be the consequence. That's the way I look at it. And uh, yeah, every policy that you implement, depending on the country, has its results, and you have to live with those results. And a good uh, way of looking at what results we've had is looking at the history and saying, you know, what was done in the past and what outcomes did we get out of those policies? And that's where you should look at politics as far as I'm concerned. Other than that, uh, I put it in the context of extinction, and I'm saying all these people, no matter what they do, is irrelevant. All of them. I don't care what the Chinese do, what the Russians do, what the every country in Africa does, every country in South America. It doesn't matter because we're all due for extinction, and uh, it's inevitable. And none of this, and none of these politicians will be able to change that course. Okay, so uh, that's why I don't pay attention to politics anymore. Another reason. Okay, another person asked a similar question. He says, you've spoken about your fa falling out with socialism. A lot of people argue whether or not Marxism could work as a political system. The truth is, any political or economic system can work as long as it works on paper, right? We can make anything work for that matter. But, you know, we're humans and we have 8 billion uh, minds out there, each one pulling their cart in their own direction, you know? It's very hard to put that all together. There is nothing wrong with anarchism or democracy or a 1984 state. People can organize societies in all sorts of ways, and those systems can last for hundreds of years. Uh -huh. 
The key is the content of the system, in other words, the people, right? The people can be errant, faithful, uh, industrious, or hopeless. They make or break the system because living things, especially humans, are unpredictable. Yeah, meaning we all have our ways of thinking, and therefore, you know, you can't say that this policy is going to produce this effect necessarily. There's a tendency to produce certain effects, but not precisely the one you want. Okay, that's the point. And this tells us that the culture, and more importantly, genetics, is the determining factor in the success of a political or economic system. Uh, I'm not going to say that genetics um, uh, it really has a bearing. Uh, you know, you, you take the uh, American Indians, you know, they were displaced by the U.S. Army in the uh, late uh, 19th century, uh, killed a lot of Indians, and essentially you were fighting, you know, you had Indians who were in the hunter-gathering stage, they were still shooting arrows at buffalo, you know, and they were competing against people who were much better armed, right? Better organized, uh, more population also, etc. And so, you know, the, the white man, he displaced the red man. That's what actually happened. And, um, and you know, you have people like Ayn Rand, uh, Ayn Rand, you know, and she says, well, they deserved it because they were weak. I wouldn't take it that far, but what is a reality is that, you know, someone who is superior uh, in development will usually conquer someone who is less developed and enslave them or, you know, uh, compel them to pay tribute, you know, which is about the same thing. Uh, so this does happen. Yeah, uh, it's happened throughout history. And he, it's not the fault of the Indians. I wouldn't say they deserved it, but it's what happened. Okay, And uh, there was not much they could do about it. They were displaced out of their lands, pushed out. And the white man took over. <laughs> and this land is our land now. Nah, it's not your land anymore. That's the way it worked. And there's not, and that's all you can say about politics. You know, it's it's just the law of the strongest. Okay? It, in the end, it, that's what it is. And only when two strong or equally strong uh, groups meet, that's when they decide to sign a treaty of some kind. Otherwise, you know, the strong will always overcome the weak. And so, um, you know, and again, uh, I don't see this in the context of extinction. I don't think it really matters. Uh, we're due for extinction. There's nothing we can do about it. Why? Because the whole system is going to collapse. Uh, economic system is going to collapse. It's going to collapse uh, partly due to wars. You know, we're now getting into all these wars. Uh, we can say we've started World War III in the sense that, you know, the whole world is up in arms in many parts of the world, at least there, there's a lot of activity, right? And uh, it might stop a few months down the road, or it could get worse. And if it gets worse, uh, you can say that, you know, now you're seeing the beginning of World War III. What is different about World War III than uh, from World War II or World War I is that we're in the service economy. And so manufacturing is not going to put people back to work like it did, you know, in World War II, for example. That's not going to happen. And so uh, war is now uh, not, uh, doesn't favor, doesn't favor um, getting more jobs, you know, expanding, etc. War is now going to be destructive only. There will be nothing getting us out of war uh, other than, you know, treaties and uh, having peace with our neighbors. And uh, that's another reason which I don't, for which I don't get involved in the politics anymore is that, you know, when I was in my 20s, you know, I knew everything about politics. You couldn't convince me of anything. <laughs> uh, I was an expert in politics. And, uh, and that is, you know, you wanted this ideal world. You wanted the brotherhood of man, you know, uh, love thy neighbor, you know, peace on earth, goodwill to man. It never happened, at least in my life, <laughs> and I don't think it'll ever happen. It's a it's a great ideal, but Mother Nature has other plans, and the nature and the what Mother Nature has, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, competition. You need to fight. They want people to fight. Uh, you know, uh, the lion doesn't reach an agreement with the other lion. Said, look, look, let's not fight, guys. Why don't we just 
you know, share our harems with each other. <laughs> you get to sleep with her and I get to sleep with the other one over there. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You got to fight. You're forced to fight. Mother Nature wants you to fight. You know, and uh, T-Rexes must have had the same situation. I would take it all the way to the uh, Cambrian, right? There's always been uh, competition fighting. When that stops, it's because the animals don't exist anymore. <laughs> They're not around. They disappeared. They became extinct. So the way I look at all this is very simple, you know, and that is that, um, let me turn this off here for a second here. Uh, that is that, you know, uh, competition is, is how Mother Nature likes it. She wants uh, within the species and between species to, for there to be fighting. There's got to be a struggle, you know, and, and this uh, socialism, you could say, uh, where we're all brothers, we agree to lay down our weapons and work together, uh, you know, like in uh, some of these... Um, uh, they call them kohoses in uh, Russian or in uh, kibbutz in, in uh, uh, Israel, you know, these um, uh, agricultural compounds where they all get together, these cooperatives and so on. And that's not the way it works for the whole world. You know, you can't run the world like that. And that's what I used to believe in. I don't believe in that anymore. <laughs> and, or, and fought for it and so on. Won't, won't do it anymore. I, I learned my lesson. Okay, uh, Wenfall says the following. This one struck a chord with me. It says, dinosaurs didn't go extinct. Oh my God, I didn't know that. Okay, it's just false to think that modern biological classification doesn't assert fairly strongly that birds are dinosaurs. Uh -huh. It's a consensus. The way biology classifies species and groups of species is in terms of evolutionary descent. And there's just no account of what the uh, group dinosaur is that would include, for example, T-Rex and stegosaurs and not include eagles and crows and ravens. In other words, he says the, the term dinosaur has not been very precisely defined. It's kind of broadly defined and it includes the birds. So he says dinosaurs didn't go extinct because the birds are still around. That's what not only him, but lots of people out there say this. Uh, no. <laughs> No, once again, no, no, no way. So what's the problem with this? Well, we got to go kind of slowly here, okay? You look at birds, you know, and uh, the, are they dinosaurs? Well, let's find out, uh, because this fellow says uh, that's what uh, the biologists, paleontologists, this, they all agree that they have this consensus that birds are dinosaurs, okay? Dinosaurs, if you recall, Jurassic and Cretaceous. Right? And before the Jurassic, there was a period known as the Triassic. And the kings of the Triassic were the Archosaurs, okay? And so you look it up and you find out this. Archosaurs is a clade of diapsid, sauropsid, uh, te tetrapods, with birds and crocodilians being the only living representative. Birds? I thought they were dinosaurs. Now it turns out that the birds are Archosaurs. Uh, they're like you know, those uh, crocodiles there, because that's what archosaurs were primarily. You know, they were these um, uh, uh, crocodiles that walked on either two legs or four legs, you know, so they were more like land animals, I guess. Uh, but this is what uh, was, uh, these were the reigning species throughout the uh, Triassic. And now the, this person says that everybody's agreed that the birds really are dinosaurs. And here it says they were not dinosaurs, they were archosaurs. Or at least that they were not, they're not saying that they were not dinosaurs, but that they're archosaurs. Archosaurs are distinct from dinosaurs. So are birds dinosaurs or are they archosaurs? And you can see there it says, you know, the whole thing, uh, same thing, uh, that uh, archosauria includes crocodilians and extinct relatives and includes birds. Okay, so it's confirmed uh, birds are archosaurs, or descend from them. So what's the problem here? Uh, I mean, can we really say that, um, that uh, dinosaurs never went extinct because the birds are still around and they are part of uh, the dinosaurs? Well, we can just as well say the archosaurs never went extinct 
because the birds are still around. In fact, I'll go even further and say that the synapses, you know, the uh, mammal-like reptiles of the Permian, they never went extinct because the birds are still around. And, um, you know, the amphibians of the uh, Carboniferous, they wouldn't go extinct because the birds are still around. And I guess I can take that all the way to Cambrian. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem here is when people use things out of context, words out of context, because they never define them in the proper context. Okay? When they, when they talk about clays in a, in a given uh, context, you can say that, you know, birds uh, came from a similar line or branched off from the dinosaurs sometime in the past. That's different than saying, talking about extinction. Okay, when we talk about extinction, we know what an archosaur is. And we don't say, oh, the birds are, the archosaurs are still around because the birds are still flying around. No, we don't say that because the archosaur, in the context of extinction, in the context of extinction, refers to those animals that died at the end of the Triassic. There are no archosaurs today. And I don't care if birds are archosaurs or not, there are no archosaurs in the context of extinction. And when we talk about the extinction of the dinosaurs, we're talking about the same thing. We're saying that those dinosaurs that we call dinosaurs, that everybody relates to and uh, normally associates with the word dinosaurs, those died at the end of the Cretaceous, okay? They're not around anymore. What, what we have around today is a branch that branched off early, and we don't call them dinosaurs. We don't call a bird a dinosaur, okay? And so, yeah, because if we do, then uh, we have this situation. You know, you got to watch out in New York City if one of these um, T Rexes are still flying around. You, you look at the sky, you know, call 911 if, if you see something like this. No, no, the birds are still around because they're not dinosaurs in the context of the word extinction. In the context of the word extinction, you're talking about two different things when you say that the dinosaurs are still alive today because the birds are alive. That's an irrational statement, okay, because you're confusing the context. That's the problem there, okay? Here, um, uh, I mean, can we say that the synapsids are still around? You know, the pelicosaurs of the Permian or the therapsids of the late Permian? You know, here, here you, let me show you a picture here of these, okay? These are the synapsids. So there's one of two major clades of vertebrate animals in the group Amniata, okay? The other being the seropsids, okay? So, uh, which includes the reptiles and birds, okay? So the first ones, the synapsids, you know, they include us. You know, they include the mammals, okay? We descend from them. We did not descend from the seropsids or the reptiles or the birds. We descended from the synapsids. Okay, so there you have two examples. Uh, the first, the one on the left is um, uh, uh, Dimetrodon, and the one on the right is uh, Gorg Gorgonops, okay? Uh, first one, is, the one on the left is more from the early Permian, the second one is from the late Permian. Uh, do any of those look like your mother? Okay, if they do, well, uh, then maybe the synapses are still around, you know? But if, uh, if your mother looks a little different than them, then maybe, you know, the synapses are no longer around because we descend from the synapses as well. So it's irrational to say that the synapses never became extinct because we humans are still alive and we descend from them. You know, how far are you going to take this? Again, it means that you're not understanding the context when you say something dumb like that, like saying, you know, the, the birds are still around and so the dinosaurs didn't die. No, that's the wrong context, okay? The dinosaurs died at 65 million years ago. No dinosaur survived, what we call a dinosaur. And in the context of extinction, that's what we call a dinosaur. You cannot say that, that the dinosaurs are still living and flying around in New York City because, you know, we still have birds, which are dinosaurs. No, birds are not dinosaurs for that purposes, for the purposes of extinction. That's the context. Please do not confuse it, okay? Don't make irrational statements like saying, you know, the dinosaurs are still around because the birds are flying. That's, that, this comes out of paleontologists who are not really paleontologists. What they are is stamp collectors. You know, they, people think a, a paleontologist is a guy who goes in there like, you know, uh, uh, Indiana Jones. 
You know, he goes with a gun and with a whip. Is that are those the tools of a you know of a paleontologist? A gun and a whip. Oh yeah, sometimes he takes a pick and a hammer also. What does he go? He goes in there and he you know breaks up the rock, pulls out a bone, assembles it, puts it in a uh, in a museum, and starts collecting money. Now that's not a paleontologist. That is a stamp collector. Paleontologist is one thing and one thing only. It's a person who can explain extinction because it's part of science, and science is only about explaining rationally. So we need a rational explanation for extinction. That's what a paleontologist does. And we don't have any paleontologists on Earth because all paleontologists have irrational uh, explanations for how animals in the past died. They don't have an explanation for mass extinction or for background extinction, you know, when a single species dies. All background extinctions, man did them all. We killed them all. That's, that's the answer they'll give you. It's an irrational explanation and then a mechanism. And then uh, how did the mass extinctions occur in the past? Well, they have no clue. They always come up with all these catastrophes. It's only catastrophes that they put forth. Oh, there was a climate change. Oh, there was a disease. Oh, there was a, an asteroid that hit the Earth or maybe a supernova that blew up up there somewhere in, in the skies. No, no, none of those can explain the only thing a, uh, a, an extinction theory, a theory of extinction has to explain, and that is selectivity. If you cannot explain selectivity, you do not have a theory of extinction, because that's the only thing you have to explain. How does Mother Nature choose a clade or uh, an order or whatever, a group of animals, and leave the ones next to them alive? And when they have to go in, you know, and do ad hoc stuff, like, you know, for every species, you got to make an exception and say, well, this one, this one hit, was hit by sulfuric acid and the other one, it was acid rain. And no, when you have to, you know, make an exception for every species, it's because you don't have a theory. Mother Nature doesn't have a hundred different theory, hundred different mechanisms for producing extinction. Okay, she only has one for mass extinction and one for background. Okay, there are no billions of theories for how animals disappear, okay? And hopefully they're all natural. Mother Nature is natural. Okay, uh, so here we have uh, one extinction that happened. It's called the Olsen's extinction. It happened somewhere around the mid-Permian, okay? And I like what they say here. It says, possible causes, this is out of the Wikipedia, in the peer-reviewed encyclopedia, people sometimes say, oh, but uh, the Wikipedia, you know, anybody can post there. Not so. It's peer-reviewed. You try to change some of the, especially the scientific articles, and you'll find a whole bunch of people who peer-review what you just said. They won't allow you to put anything you want in there. So, yeah, you can say it's peer-reviewed, especially when it's run by or monitored by a lot of so-called scientists out there that have their ideas from college, from university, and they will not allow you to put just anything in the Wikipedia. So don't tell me it's not peer-reviewed. It is. Uh, unofficially, but it is. It's censored. Okay. Uh, anyways, Olson's mass extinction out of the Wikipedia. Possible causes. There is no widely accepted theory for the cause of Olson's extinction. No kidding. They don't have a theory for any of the extinctions for that matter. Recent research has indicated that climate change may be a possible cause. Climate change cannot cause an extinction, never caused an extinction on the face of the earth in the history of life on earth. Extreme environments were observed from the Permian of Kansas, which resulted in, from a combination of hot climate and acidic waters. And that's all they can produce, these nonsense theories. You know, they cannot explain with this how animals die. They don't die because the climate changed over thousands of years. It doesn't work that way. Okay? And uh, here, uh, you can see what happened. This is Olson's extinction right there around the center of the uh, Permian, somewhere in the middle. Okay? And you can see there was a difference in the types of synapsids. Uh, you got the uh, age of pelicosaurs, the ones on the left that look more like reptiles. You got the other ones, the therapsids, and they look more like, you know, lions, you could say, you know, or uh, hippopotamuses or whatever, okay? So you can see they're, they're kind of different. Uh, but what's the issue here? The issue is that you say, well, why are these 
an animal's not quite, especially the seraphids, right? Why aren't they classified as mammals? They look pretty much like mammals to me. And the reason they're not mammals is these are lions that laid eggs. <laughs> these are wolves that laid eggs or, or uh, bears that laid eggs, okay? These animals laid eggs. That's why they have some characteristics of mammals and some characteristics of reptiles, you know? I mean, we're talking about way back when. And so, yeah, the, we can't say that the uh, therapsids or the synapsids or, or the mammal-like reptiles in general are still around because we are still alive. That's not rational. And here's another uh, take. This is the uh, dinosaurs group, okay? They really started around the Triassic. There you can see some of the types of uh, dinosaurs they found in those days. We have very few samples from the Triassic, really from the Middle Triassic onwards. And then really they uh, bloomed in the Jurassic. And you say, well, why did they bloom? Well, a good reason that they bloom is in the Triassic, at the end of the Triassic, at the border with the Jurassic, the uh, dichrodiums, uh, type of uh, seed fern died out. And it's not just one plant, it was a, a family or order of plants called dichrodiums. And they were all over the planet. So uh, the point here is that if, uh, uh, what is it, an archosaur wanted to live, wanted to survive, he had to eat that because that was per, pretty much the only food that was around. That was the issue, okay? And so here we have uh, the dichrodiums disappear, and guess what? The archosaurs disappeared, except for the birds, right? <laughs> and then we have the Jurassic. You had these long necks. Uh, Jurassic was specifically an age of the long necks. Not, not exclusively, but it's characterized by dinosaurs who had long necks. When you get to the Cretaceous, you can see what's happening. There's a transition there, and you get another type of um, dinosaur, more or less like what I just showed for the, uh, um, you know, the uh, synapses of the Permian. You know, uh, the, the, what changed was the morphology of these animals. There are different types of animals. The first ones like to eat, you know, the uh, from the high trees because they had long necks. Obviously, um, they had some, uh, they were eating from the top of the trees, in other words. Whereas the ones that come in the Cretaceous, they eat more closer to the ground. Okay? And it's good that you read the Dinosaur Heresies of Robert Baker, and he does a good job of explaining all that stuff in quite a bit of detail. All I can tell you is that um, you cannot say that, <laughs> that the dinosaurs are still around because we still have birds. That's the wrong context for the word bird. You cannot associate the word bird and dinosaur together with the word extinction. We're talking about two different things, okay? Whether birds descended or, or were a line parallel to the dinosaurs that branched out at some point, uh, irrelevant to the question at hand. The question at hand is the word dinosaur fits in the context of extinction. Those all died, no dinosaurs survived past 65 or there about 65 million years ago, okay? So you can't say that dinosaurs are still flying around New York City. <laughs> but some people believe this, you know, and that's what they repeat without understanding the context. 